The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. I am the agent for truth, Joe Bannister, your host. It's Saturday, March 27th, 2010. I'm coming to you live on Frank Talk 104.3 FM, as well as worldwide over the Internet at LWRN.net. LWRN.net is the flagship website for Liberty Works Radio Network, the network that brings you this fine programming that you will not hear anywhere else. We need your support at LWRN. You can go to LWRN.net or uh, call the network at 410-848-9191, which is also the call-in number. Well, uh, as always, I dedicate my show to our Father in Heaven. I urge you to pray as Jesus instructed us in Matthew chapter 6. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Well, our country is in deep, deep trouble, and I urge everyone to fervently pray for God's blessings on our country. Let's redouble our efforts to obey his commandments, especially refraining from taking the Lord's name in vain. You can join my email list by going to freedomabovefortune.com. I've got a new uh, website called agentfortruth.com, and I encourage you to have paper and pen handy because we always try to give out uh, very good information for you. I'm a former IRS Criminal Investigation Division Special Agent, worked for the IRS from 1993 through 1999, and uh, normally give a little bit more information, but what we're going to do a little something different this time. Uh, I have a guest, uh, Attorney Tom Cryer. He's been with us before. And what we're going to do is uh, basically Tom's going to interview me for the first hour, and I'm going to interview him for the second hour. And uh, we believe that we have uh, pretty compelling stories. Uh, thanks, thanks much to the IRS uh, and how they, how they do things. So, Tom, um, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Always a pleasure. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, go ahead, Tom. You know, uh, you, you know, you mentioned it all sort of an unusual format today, but uh, a lot of folks, you know, I get emails or I'll get, you know, uh, a call or whatnot, and they're, they're saying, well, you know, this, you keep referring to a story, you keep referring to a struggle, but, you know, people like you and I don't really like to go out and talk about ourselves, and so we don't get the story out, but really your story, and I suppose to a lesser extent mine, are uh, you know can are really something the public needs to know, and uh, we don't we don't get out there and pump ourselves because of our personalities just don't fit that way, do they? No, but uh, we've been we've been urged to to get the story out, so uh, <laughs> they'll they'll say it say it again and uh, be happy to do so. No, well, I think it's important that we do because you know, uh, f- folks. Uh, are listening to what you and I have to say uh, during the course of our programs, and I've got I have a program uh, on Monday through Friday from five to six Eastern on this network. Uh, you have this program for two hours on Saturday mornings, and uh, I think it's important that they know who they're hearing from. You know, because we're not just people who just walked off the street and said, "Hey, I've got an opinion." Both of us come from. Uh, backgrounds where we're in a position to know things that the general public doesn't have access to. Yeah, very very unique uh, uh, history, and of course that gives us a unique opportunity to uh, let people know some uh, quite an interesting story. Well, if you only want to, we just go ahead and get started. I'm going to take over your show for the first hour, as I understand Please do. It. Take, take the controls, Captain. And, uh, you know, uh, let, let's start with Letting people know where's Joe Bannister come from? How did he, uh, you know, who is he? What's his uh, his training? What what's his education? And uh, and how did he get, 
you know, more or less, into, of all places, a man of integrity in the Internal Revenue Service. Well, I grew up in San Jose, California, um, you know, middle, cra- middle class upbringing, uh, Roman Catholic uh, elementary school, high school, went on to college at San Jose State University, I graduated from there uh, way back in 1986, and my degree was in accounting, so um, that was the kind of work that I did after graduating from, from college. And uh, after a few years uh, working in the accounting field, I uh, realized just how incredibly boring that kind of work was. And, you know, people might think, well, couldn't you figure that out on day one of your accounting class? (laughs) And I probably should have. But uh, a mentor of mine when I was a young man said that, you know, if you get a degree in accounting, if you get an accounting uh, background, you'll always have work. And uh, he was really right. Um, I actually planned to pursue a um, career in law, but it just got to be uh, too much uh, at that time, you know, with all the other things going on in my life. So anyway, got the degree in accounting and worked in the private sector accounting for a number of years and then just kept having this feeling that I cannot do this kind of work for another 30 years. And so I started to look around for um, an alternative and I had a number of friends and family who were in law enforcement, um, mostly local and state law enforcement, uh, but even a, at least one gentleman who was in federal law enforcement. Uh, he was in a, an agency called the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. And so I really got this bug that I wanted to pursue a career in law enforcement. I thought, surely uh, that will keep my interest and I'll stay motivated, you know, clear till retirement. And so I looked around, and uh, I also spoke to this friend. Uh, his name was Bob. Um, you know, still talk to Bob today. And he had spent, at that time, he was maybe 20 or 25 years as a special agent for the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. And, uh, you know, he was in the IRS during the 70s and 80s, um, uh, working on all kinds of corruption cases. And he had another agent in the FBI, um, who they were good friends. And so Bob enabled me to speak with this FBI agent, and of course I spoke with Bob about federal law enforcement, and they were able to convince me quite easily that uh, a federal career in law enforcement would be preferable to a state or local, mainly because of my background uh, in accounting and finance and tax. So I went ahead and um, submitted an application to the FBI and the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. My friend Bob said that, well, you're better off, you know, sending in applications to various agencies. If you put all your eggs in one basket, uh, you know, you might, you might be disappointed. And, and he was right. Uh, my heart was set on the FBI. Of course, they have uh, TV shows and movies about them. <laughs> the X, even the X-Files, right? But uh, the IRS... list and all that. Pardon me? Ephraim Symbolist and all of the, you know, the, the, uh, those, those programs were exciting, you know, this, that, and the other. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, if you're at the, uh, the cocktail party and, you know, it just happens to come up what you do for a living, I mean, everybody's ooing and eyeing and, you know, but if you tell them, if somebody says that you work for the IRS, you'll wonder why there's no one left in the building. So. Yeah, you start to check your armpits. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I, I was preferred preferred the FBI, and I went down that route um, of ap- applying, going through their background investigations, which are quite uh, severe, and uh, you know basically qualified. Went through all their medical, physical, anything that they could do to me, psychological, and was ready to be hired. But uh, the FBI at that time in the early 90s was going undergoing a hiring freeze. They could not hire a single person because the Congress was at a standstill and could not uh, pass a budget. So meanwhile, I'm in this two-year waiting period, holding period, basically waiting for this holding, this uh, hiring freeze to end. And meanwhile, um, it was about August of 1993, after about two years of waiting, that the IRS Criminal Investigation Division from San Francisco, they called me and asked me if I'd be interested in a position with them. And for those that, you know, don't know, the IRS, uh, they have various divisions within it. 
Uh, there's the examination division. Those are the auditors that come out and audit you. Uh, the, the collection division, those are all the revenue officers that come and seize your bank accounts and uh, put liens on your house. And then there's the Criminal Investigation Division, and they, uh, about 3,000 special agents, they are criminal investigators, and they investigate violations of the federal tax and money laundering laws. So meanwhile, I'm waiting for the FBI, and they're not you know, going to hire me, and the IRS comes along. And so basically the idea grew on me that, wow, you know, maybe this wouldn't be too bad. I mean, I'm already an accountant. I'm already a certified public accountant. Uh, courtesy of the state of California. Um, you know, I think this would be quite interesting work. I'm certainly geared up for it. Uh, and, you know, maybe maybe being able to uh, tout that I'm a, an FBI agent isn't all that that's cracked up to be. I mean, you know, it's, is there a little too much pride going on there? And what about the actual work? So uh, the idea grew on me, and in November of 1993, I went ahead and... Um, uh, agreed uh, or accepted the offer to become a special agent for the IRS, and it was November of 1993 that I was sworn in there. Um, interesting that the swearing-in ceremony, you know, I've seen them be where there'll be 20, 30, or 50 uh, new IRS agents that are brought in for the to swear an oath to support and defend the Constitution, and on the particular day that I was sworn in, I was the only employee. So uh, I got to do it up in the, you know, 14th floor of the uh, federal building. Uh, They're in the chief's office. He's got the corner office with the windows overlooking the San Francisco Bay with the flag and my family and the video camera. And it was very, very meaningful. Um, And especially because I was taking an oath to God to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And, of course, I uh, very much... You know that 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 oath meant a lot to me, and I intended to obey it and abide by it throughout my career, and I was very mindful of it. I just didn't realize at the time I took it what that would actually entail down the road. <laughs> I can identify with that. <laughs> That's right, because you you took the same type of oath, uh, well, more than once. Well, you know, oddly enough, uh, you know, when I uh, when I was sworn in uh, to the bar, I was. Uh, stationed at Fort Harrison, Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, or just outside Indianapolis, and uh, had to catch a flight down to New Orleans for the swearing-in ceremony. And uh, my plane was delayed, or the flight canceled because of mechanical problems, and I was late getting to New Orleans, and by the time I got there, the swearing-in ceremony had already occurred. So I was, uh, the State Department had a limousine at the airport, and they grabbed me up and ran me downtown and uh, ushered me up to the chambers of Chief Justice Summers of the Louisiana Supreme Court. And I, too, for, you know, you and I keep finding similarities, Joe, (laughs) but I, too, ended up with a personal swearing-in ceremony uh, conducted by Chief Justice uh, Summers uh, in chambers and uh, with my parents. Uh, there and it was a, uh, it was a uh, uh, an occurrence you know that you never ever forget. But go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. But you, uh, so here you are. You're bound. You're locked. You're loaded. Uh, you're heavily armed, and uh, you're conferred with credentials, and you're sent out into the world to, uh, you know, I don't want to say wreak havoc, but to. Uh, to enforce the laws of the United States and to bring the constitutional intent to bear. Absolutely. And, of course, I had that mindset, uh, you know, part of the oath that you say that uh, without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Right. And perhaps there's those people that, you know, just take the oath and they don't really know what they're taking an oath to, don't really care. Uh, But I I definitely cared. I really was very mindful of those words. Um, so, yeah, I did kind of hit the ground running. Uh, well, I guess we've got a break here. Yeah, let's, uh, let's roll we'll in come this back. break. Uh, folks, we, you know, we're, we're getting a, a get the host instead of get the guest in a Wolfian sense. Uh, you know, Virginia Wolf uh, sense. We're not going to get the guest. We're going to get the host, and the host can get even next hour. We've got Joe Bannister on the deck 
being interviewed. You're going to learn his story. Don't you don't want to miss this story. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, your host. And we've uh, turned the tables a bit. Uh, my guest, attorney Tom Cryer, is interviewing me for the first hour, and then I'm going to interview him for the second hour. So, Tom, uh, handing the controls back over to you. All right. Uh, you know, uh, now they got you on the deck, probably I could ask you some pretty embarrassing questions, but I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, you, you, here you are. Uh, when we left off for, for those exciting commercials and announcements, uh, here you are sworn in. You're all decked out. You've got your badge. You've got your, your sidearm. Uh, you've got your jaw set. You're ready to go out into the world and do a lot of good and serve your country. Uh, at that time, did you realize that your country and your government weren't the same? I did not. I mean, I certainly had some indications. You know, I was a pretty avid reader of newspapers. Uh, I listened to talk radio shows on on the you know, AM radio. Uh, I knew that there were some big problems, but I, you know, I just never thought I, I never would have taken the job at the IRS had I known that there was such a, a flouting, you know, an ignoring of of the law and. Um, you know, going way beyond uh, the authority that the law had given the, the agency or the federal government in general. So, uh, no, I had no idea that, well, uh, of what I was about to find a few well, years know, later. They, they didn't just hand you a badge and a gun and say, get out there, boy. They they put you through uh, a uh, an indoctrination or training process. Uh, can you describe that generally, what you went through as far as how did they uh, tell you what law you were going to enforce and how you were going to go about doing it? Well, uh, interesting, the, the first day on the job, actually the day before I went over to get sworn in, um, I was sitting there at my desk and I was al- almost twiddling my thumbs, but you know, coming from the private sector, that was a, a no-no. I, I didn't want to be you know, getting paid for doing nothing, but I had no casework, nothing to work on. So I reached up in the shelf above me to the Internal Revenue Code and I began to open these big, thick books for anyone that's seen them uh, to look at the actual statutes that I'd be investigating. And my boss, who, a guy named Alex, a former Marine, he comes over and barks at me and says, what are you doing looking in that book? And I said sheepishly, well, I'm just looking at the statutes that I'm going to be investigating. He said, close that book. You're not a CPA anymore. You're an IRS special agent. You don't need to be looking in that book. Did so, that cost you any... Did, did that cause you any concern, or did it raise any questions in your mind? Well, that I, the I, law that you're supposed to to enforce is off limits. It was, some, you know, some real culture shock there. I mean, I, I didn't really understand the ramifications at the time. I thought it was just, you know, this former marine who just likes to bark around at people. And but you know, it was very different than what I had experienced in the private sector, where um, looking into what the law says is is favored it's not frowned upon and yet my first day on the job when i really have no other work to do anyway uh... i'm trying to actually at least do some research and i get my my hand slapped so it certainly was a factor as i began to put these things together that the irs didn't do things uh... you know according to hoyle i also under underwent a background investigation for the irs and part of that involves an audit and uh, it's a kind of a long story, but I just I basically was audited as an employee, and they made some allegations that were completely false, and I had to fight them, you know, IRS fighting IRS, to say that these were completely false allegations, and I ended up prevailing, and I actually ended up getting a refund. I got I was too conservative on the tax returns at that time, and got a refund. So <laughs> <laughs> there. There were these incidences that happened directly to me that so made you me had, wonder. You had some red flags there, but yeah. just didn't recognize them at the time. Exactly. But when you look back, all of a sudden they take on a little more significance, don't they? 
Right, which I'm sure most people, you know, in their lives, they kind of look back at different experiences and think, wow, I, I should have put yeah. two and two together at that time. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you're rocking along, or, or is, is, and, and you get your training, and uh, I take it the training didn't involve a lot of examination of the law itself, too. Uh, well, yeah, they, they would certainly train you on uh, Fourth and Fifth Amendment, uh, you know, as far as seizure, search, um, you know, whether or not people could, could talk to you if you came up to talk to them. You know, did they have a right to uh, not speak to you? Were they required to speak to you uh, about how grand juries work and how, you know, you'd actually charge someone with a crime, uh, the elements to a crime, uh, learning about investigating a crime scene. Uh, these, this is the same kind of training that they'll put a deputy U.S. marshal through or a U.S. Secret Service agent or a customs agent. Uh, you all go through this basic training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then the secondary training is where each agent will go and, and learn more about their own agency-specific training. So the Secret Service agents will go off and learn about uh, you know, dignitary protection and counterfeiting, and the IRS agents will go and learn about money laundering and tax investigations. Um, so, you know, that training was really good training, and it's the same kind of training. You know, I was a criminal investigator just working for the IRS, and so I did the job for about three years uh, and really had the time of my life. I mean, I was super fulfilled with the job, uh, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on a power trip where I was enjoying shaking people down for their meal and entertainment receipts. I mean, I was working on very high-level investigations, uh, sometimes jointly with the FBI and the DEA and the U.S. Customs Service. And um, I thought, wow, I mean, this has been a great three years. Uh, I can only imagine how much fun the next 17 years are going to be. Yeah. Uh, the thing about federal law enforcement is you only have to work 20 years to get a full uh, retirement. So... You know, I'd be in my early 50s and retired, and I just thought, there's just life couldn't be better than this. Right. Well, in December of 1996, approximately three years into my work there, I was listening to a talk radio show. As I said, I was an avid uh, listener, um, you know, read all about current events and things. And this uh, show in the San Francisco Bay Area on KSFO uh, had a host named Jeff Metcalf. He spells his name odd, uh, G-E-O-F-F, -F, or at least uh, unique. Jeff Metcalf, and Jeff had a guest on his show whose name was D.V. Kidd, and her first name was spelled D-E-V-V-Y, D.V. Kidd. And uh, so I'm listening to the show, and, you know, I was always like Jeff before because he was very truthful. He didn't seem to be partisan, you know, where Republicans are always right and Democrats are always wrong. He just would talk about truth. He would talk about the Constitution. Uh, I really, really liked him. I thought he had a lot of integrity. Then he has this guest, D.V. Kidd, on the show, and she's basically saying that the income tax is voluntary uh, in the sense that when you look at the actual laws that passed by Congress, the vast majority of Americans you know, are, are not required to pay the income tax, and yet they're paying it anyway. And she would point out uh, you know, basically fraud and deceit uh, on the part of the IRS to get people to, to do this. So, you know, if you can imagine me driving around in my government car doing my investigations and listening to this show and, uh, you know, having some lady come on the show and say the income tax is voluntary, and I'm thinking to myself, well, lady, if you check out this Sig Sauer 9mm that I got on my hip and these handcuffs, uh, this tax ain't voluntary. Yeah. Um, but... I just, uh, you thought she was, had a lot to learn, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, she had a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, it was compelling in the sense that this talk show host, I thought, okay, there's a problem here. Either no. Joe isn't this great crack investigator that he thought he was because he has misread Jeff Metcalf and his integrity, or there's something to what DV Kid says about the income tax. Well, and I, I mean, thought. Let me ask you something at this point. You know, you was that your first exposure uh, to the tax honesty movement, or had you had occasion to investigate so-called tax protesters prior to that time? Uh, no, in, no investigation. Uh, the, the only exposure was probably uh, IRS training and, and pamphlets uh, explaining that there was this group of people called illegal tax protesters. Uh, which, by the way, the, the IRS is now forbidden to use the term. 
Uh, but there's this group called Illegal Tax Protesters, and they come up with this cockamamie, you know, BS that shouldn't be believed or even looked at. And that was basically my mindset uh, prior to hearing TV Kid on the radio. All right. So after hearing her, how was that different? Well, it was different because the credibility that, that Jeff Metcalf had, had given to me over a two-year period prior to that made me think that he was credible. I mean, I really believed in the man. And then when he has the woman on the show saying these cra- crazy things about the income tax, I thought, okay, you know, what's wrong with you, Joe? I, I thought you could... I thought I could read people. You know, Jeff Metcalf's a man of integrity. I listened to him daily for two years. Um, but the income tax ain't voluntary either, so how can he be having this woman on the show? So I had to get to the bottom of this uh, this discrepancy, you know, between what my trust in Jeff Metcalf versus this stuff that I thought was outlandish uh, said by D.V. Kidd. And so she gave the opportunity to order some little booklets that she put out and gave an address, and they were like a, a buck a piece. So, you know, she wasn't making any money off of it. And so I ordered these little booklets, and they're about 50 pages a piece. One was called Why a Bankrupt America, and the other was called Blind Loyalty. I imagine they're still around. And uh, so I ordered these books, received them, and began this about a two year process on evenings and weekends trying to get to the bottom of, of DV's allegations, her claims that the income tax wasn't required to be paid by the vast majority of Americans. And, you know, certainly couldn't have much more of a skeptical um, observer in me, mm-hmm. but I was just driven to find out either, you know, what is it, Joe? You're not a good investigator, or there's something about this income tax. It has to be one or the other. And yet my entire professional life was wrapped up around the income tax uh, prior to going in the IRS as a CPA. And then, of course, the government uh, trusting me to carry a gun and a badge and around enforcing the income tax laws. Uh, this was not wishful thinking on my part that what DV Kid said was true. Yeah. So, so um, what, what did, where did you go and look? You know, if somebody was like you uh, hearing this today, saying, you know, well, uh, I, I want to do that. I want to go investigate that. Where did you go to investigate? Where did you look? Where did you find uh, the truth? Well, in these booklets she gave out, uh, which was contrary to what I had been trained, you know, the IRS said that these people that had these kinds of beliefs uh, w- would piece together, you know, odd things from all over the place to try to create a, a, some cockamamie argument. Um, so I, I was kind of taken aback when DV Kids booklets provided not only the names of the people making these allegations, but their phone numbers and their addresses. And of course, any you know any investigator, I mean, you use the telephone a lot more than you use your gun. Um, so I just thought I'd get on the phone and start talking to these people, and I was completely honest and open with them. I told them that you know during the day, during the week, I work as an IRS criminal investigation division special agent uh, but I'm calling you as a citizen I'm, I'm here on my own time and I'm trying to get to the bottom of these claims that DV kid made and uh, you know at first a lot of these people that I called were thinking okay come on <laughs> <laughs> I've got an IRS criminal investigator calling me and uh, he's just just on a little personal fact-finding mission you didn't understand their skepticism <laughs> yeah well <laughs> Uh, over time, I certainly I, I had to keep you know pinching myself. Now remember, Joe, these people are scared to death of you. The whole public <laughs> is. Uh, so to their credit, uh, they did you know field my calls and my questions and sent me a bunch of information even that I didn't ask for. So the bottom line was they were extremely open with me, which was also contrary to what the IRS had trained me to believe that uh, these people you know when the light of truth is shown on them. They run and hide like cockroaches. Uh huh. Well, that wasn't the case. They were extremely <laughs> open. These were cockroaches that didn't run, huh? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, that experience kept replicating itself. Well, uh, you know, so- here we are uh, running right smack dab into another break, Joe. Uh, folks, uh, you're not going to believe what happened next. You know about his his uh, commitment. You know about his revelation. Uh, and uh, what you're going to find out now is how the government reacted to it. 
uh, your public servants. Stay tuned for the rest of this story. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, the Agent for Truth, agentfortruth.com, freedomabovefortune.com. I've handed the controls over to Captain Tom Cryer, and uh, he's interviewing me here for the first hour, and I'm going to interview him for the second. So, uh, Tom, here you go. All right. You know, we left off, and you had gone in and studied uh, for two years. You, you dug and conducted your own independent investigation into the, the merits or demerits of these wild uh, illegal tax protester claims that the income tax law did not require most Americans to pay the tax or to file a return. Uh, well, what was your finding? What was the ultimate result of your investigation? Well, the short story, after you know two years of this part-time off-duty research and investigation, is that I had to you know, uh, conclude that what DV Kid said on the radio that day was, was largely true, that the average American you know, working for a living uh, not you know going off abroad to work or uh, anything like that, but just you know the average Joe uh, working in America uh, did not was not required to pay the income tax and, and file these federal tax returns. And of course uh, that was a bit uh, inconsistent with uh, the job <laughs> that I had uh, held and uh, what they wanted me to do. So I decided that the best course of action was to. Uh, submit some some of this evidence that I had accumulated to my supervisors at the IRS and tell them that, you know, I was having some difficulty because I basically arrived at a conclusion that I didn't expect to. Uh, but, you know, evidence is evidence. And you'd think that with a, an audience of other criminal investigators, that they would agree with that. Uh, but now, you know, we're talking about uh, pensions and paychecks and uh, careers and all kinds of things. So, I basically well, before before you get into what you did and what how they responded, uh, let me ask you something because this is something you and I have both experienced, and I'm just curious. Uh, I know, and I'll never forget, you know what it felt like when I had to finally turn loose of lifelong hill beliefs that were based on what somebody said, that somebody heard somebody say. Uh, what did you? What? Did, how did you feel about it? Whenever you you finally had to conclude that everything you know that the IRS was doing to the to working Americans, to people out there like you and me, uh, was illegal. Well, it it rocked my world, Tom. I mean, I when I was going to elementary school and high school, you know, the they, we still had a Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, right? And uh, Fidel Castro and all the propaganda you know, that went with it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, uh, stories about how people with a gun would be put to their head so that they would confess on a confession form, and there'd be torture and um, all of these just inhumane ugly, uh, despicable, tyrannical type governments. And I always grew up thinking that, wow, you know, how blessed I am to have grown up in a country, uh, you know, home, land of the free and home of the brave type thing. And to find out that my own government and, and the government, you know, the agency that I was working for was engaged in very similar conduct just cut me to the core. It, it just really rocked my world, and I, I just I couldn't I couldn't believe it. But it was right, you know all the evidence was right before my eyes. I had accumulated uh, and validated that evidence. So I had to think to myself, what am, what are you going to do about this, Joe? And so I thought, well, you know, my upbringing, certainly my my parents, my dad, uh, you know, who died just before I went into the IRS. He always told me to be a leader, not a follower, to tell the truth. Um, you know, do the right thing, and so I thought. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my supervisors and tell them what I've done. I've re you know done this research, show it to them, 
and hopefully, even though that they might swallow hard like I did, um, they're all they all took the same oath to support and defend the Constitution that I did, and uh, they're all trained like I was trained. Surely something can be done to get this resolved. You well, know, because apparently I, they weren't raised like you were raised, though. Well, uh, some, apparently something, was, something something didn't didn't add up. Right. So I I did go ahead and uh, accumulate you know the highlights of the. Uh, of what I had uh, validated and, and investigated, and I presented it to my supervisors, um, and I basically said, you know, I've gone to bat for this agency and the income tax, trying to disprove these, you know, so-called tax, illegal tax protester uh, arguments, but I'm not able to to refute them. I mean, the the evidence that they put forth is is compelling and true. And so I need you, my supervisors, to help me understand why I've come to this conclusion. Uh, I can't serve two masters here. You know, either what this stuff says is true, and uh, I need to change the way I I do this work, or or it's not true. But you can show me the error of my analysis, if any, and then I can put my tail between my legs and you know, Get act back like to work. and go back to work. Well, the. You know, I said, but if you can't answer my questions, if you can't help me resolve this, I'm going to have to resign uh, because I just can't continue doing this, uh, serving two masters. So uh, they they took me up on that uh, statement about resignation, and they said they would not answer any of my questions, they would not review my report or respond to it, and that they would provide me with the paperwork necessary to tender my resignation. Uh, that was their response. And, and they, they gave, you a, gave you a week to think about it. Right. They sent me home for a week. Uh, they didn't fire me, but they just sent me home for a week uh, and then expected me to tell them what I was going to do at the end of that week. So I went home and, of course, thought about it uh, quite a bit. And I thought, well, if, with all I've learned about what they've done to people uh, who have tried to expose them, uh, the last thing I want is for them to destroy my reputation because that's the only thing that will make me credible and, uh, you know, maybe people will believe me. So I decided that the best course of action was to resign, and I went ahead and did so uh, February 25th, 1999. And uh, so the the main, I guess I don't have a whole lot of time here left, so I would just say that after resigning, I spent a number of years uh, on the radio, you know, radio shows like this one. Um, there aren't that many people uh, that have worked for the IRS and have, you know, confronted them like I did while I was working there. So it tended to get a fair amount of notice. You know, uh, Peter Jennings never called me up to, to be interviewed, but there was quite a bit of Internet uh, interest and radio uh, interest. And so after all that interest uh, percolated over the years, the IRS uh, obviously was not happy with my beliefs um, nor my speaking about my story. And so they decided on uh, pounding me in a, in a couple ways. The first way was to file a complaint against me for a disreputable conduct in the way that I represented a couple of clients who had uh, IRS problems. And, of course, the, the clients never complained, uh, but the IRS complained about the way that I uh, conducted this defense of these clients. Right. And then the more, uh, more difficult, uh, challenging um, battle was that the IRS uh, and the Department of Justice indicted me for preparing three false income tax returns and conspiring to defraud the United States of America. That indictment was in November of 2004, and uh, my trial occurred about seven months later in June of 2005. And of course, uh, you know, I wouldn't wish being indicted with federal charges on my worst enemy. No. Uh, that was, uh, and you, you know, as you'll be talking about in the next hour. What an ugly experience it is to be accused of something that you've you've not done, and that's when you really look and see, wow, you know, do I do we have any rights left? And as much as I uh, join the chorus of complaining about how our rights have been attacked, thankfully we still have a few. I mean, we're exercising our First Amendment rights right now, Tom, and uh, I had a right to counsel, I had a right to a jury, I had a right to a trial. You should have a right to be able to exercise all of those rights without being uh, falsely accused of a crime in an attempt to put you in prison and shut you up. 
Oh, right. And you I mean, know, we, can... we think of other countries as putting people, locking political prisoners away, but we don't realize that we have hundreds of political prisoners locked away in prison, federal prison system right now whose only crime was to do as you've done, learn the truth, and dare to confront the government with it. That's right. And as I said earlier, you know that that's the kind of things that give me a real pit in my stomach is that I thought, and I want to make again, that this country is different than the other countries in the world. It's not a, a tyranny, at least it shouldn't be. Look at the Constitution and see if it spells tyranny as you read it. Um, but that's exactly what uh, the IRS does to people, and that's what they tried to do to me to silence and discredit me. Uh, thankfully, uh, and I, this was no surprise to me because I, I lived my life. I knew that I had done nothing wrong, nothing illegal. Uh, everything was above board, um, ethical, moral, legal. And yet, nevertheless, after a two- or three-year investigation, they decided to bring these charges against me. And thankfully, I had a really good defense team, attorney Jeffrey Dickstein, attorney Robert Bernhoft. And they, uh, you know, they say that uh, Americans are innocent until proven guilty. And I, I can tell you that that's rarely the case anymore. They've been no, you're basically that's... guilty until proven innocent. And uh, this defense team was uh, help, helped me to communicate my innocence to the jury. And the jury was just dumbfounded at how the government could bring this case and they couldn't bring forth any evidence that I had done anything wrong and under cross-examination all of the government witnesses made me look really good which again didn't surprise me because I had done everything right and good from the get-go right so so uh, you know the jury even after the, the trial they said Joe how come the government every time they got up on the witness stand they made you look good and I said well they were using my documents uh, they were using, they were telling the truth. <laughs> and uh, the fact of the matter is that this, this government uh, brought these charges against me and they had no evidence of wrongdoing. And they just hoped that they'd throw it up on the wall and see what sticks. Yep. And thankfully the jury was paying close attention and saw that this was a railroad. Well, most, juries, uh, most juries assume that the guy is guilty or he wouldn't be there. And uh, consequently they just moved forward and convict. Uh, on right. faith that the government wouldn't accuse one of us wrongfully. Exactly. And again, one, once again, I learned the hard way that uh, my government isn't to be trusted in that in that department. So I was uh, I was acquitted of all those charges, um, and that was back in June of 2005. And we're all we're approaching June of 2010. It's been uh, almost five years since that acquittal. And I just continue to do what I did before the trial, which is to, uh, when I'm invited, uh, speak about my experiences and uh, my beliefs. And I'm, I'm, I've always invited the IRS. There's no sour grapes here, even after the wrongful prosecution. Anytime they're willing to come to the table uh, and discuss this and show me where I'm wrong, I'll tell the world. And they've uh, never taken you up on that invitation? And that's the one thing they just won't do, you know. And they, they just what they do is they continue to claim that I'm a potentially dangerous taxpayer. I'm not to be believed, on and on and on. But they won't, you know, in a public uh, forum, which we've even tried a few different times with other groups. Uh, they they back out if they've even committed, or they ignore the opportunity. And uh, well, you know, people are afraid. You know, we, we ran into that phenomenon in Florida. You you were part of the team putting on the uh, Truth Attack altar seminars, and uh, you saw how one of uh, emailing out to all of the, the Tea Party leadership and whatnot frightened everybody away by saying that we were a bunch of tax evaders and we're trying to get people in trouble. Uh, a malicious and slanderous and def defamatory statement that I have no doubt was initiated on behalf of the federal government. Right, right well, at the right when, at the eleventh hour when it's too late to counter it. Right, and that's all they can do. And as you'll be able to talk about in, in during your interview in the next hour, uh, how that's all they can do is they can only lie to people and try to lie, tell people that we're not to be believed. To don't listen to them. Just like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. Right, right. Well, you know, uh, Joe, it, it's amazing at how much, you know, not just the, the, your discovery about the law, but discovery about the character 
of our government that has been taken over by these power crazed megalomaniacal pre pretenders. And uh, folks, that brings us to the conclusion of the first hour of Joe's program, but stay tuned. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, your host, the Agent for Truth, agentfortruth.com, freedomabovefortune.com. A little different format here for the show this week. Uh, my guest, attorney Tom Cryer, uh, is with us, and he spent the first hour uh, interviewing me just to kind of give people a background about uh, the reason that I no longer work for the Internal Revenue Service and how they uh, tried to railroad me into prison to discredit and silence me. And uh, they will do anything they can to discredit and silence people that have a little credibility with them. And uh, that's not to say that the, really any American who researches this and has credibility, but, you know, if you carried a gun and a badge for the Internal Revenue Service or you are an attorney at law or a certified public accountant and you speak about these things, uh, expect some extra attention from the Internal Revenue Service. Anyway, uh, we've now turned the tables back to me. I'm going to be interviewing my guest, Attorney Tom Cryer. And... Um, Tom, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, uh, Tom uh, is going to talk about how long he's been an attorney and just an incredible story. But basically, uh, similar to my story, for those who are listening in the last hour, uh, Tom spent his entire career uh, believing that, you know, he saw corruption here and there, but he believed that the income tax was uh, a properly uh, administered and enforced. And he had a friend who he was basically trying to save from jumping out of the frying pan into the fire, a friend, a fellow colleague, who indicated to Tom that he wasn't uh, filing or paying, uh, filing income tax returns and paying federal income tax. And Tom, out of concern for his friend, decided to set him straight. And Tom used his uh, legal skills uh, developed over decades to to help his friend, to show him the truth that, of course, all Americans are required to file income tax returns and pay federal income tax. So, Tom, uh, welcome back to the second hour. Uh, please tell the listeners a little bit about your background, uh, your your pedigree, your credentials, just so they get an idea of, of you know, what happened to you. Well, you know, my pedigree is, uh, you know, middle class, uh, working America. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I grew up my uh, one of seven kids on a farm. My father uh, was an electrician, uh, and uh, you know we were pretty much self-contained there. We grew or, or milked or churned or uh, raised or collected or hunted everything just about that went on the table. And we worked each other through college. I worked my way through college, uh, scholarships and whatnot, and uh, graduated from McNeese uh, State University. Uh, in three years with multiple majors, I was in a hurry. I couldn't wait to get to law school. I had known since I was young uh, that the law was uh, where I had to be. Uh, and, uh, my first exposure to the, to the United States Constitution was in civics class, and I could I can't forget you know that first time I ever read it, I ever looked at it, and that was how shocked I was at how short it was for such a big government and uh, the concepts behind it were something that just intrigued me and uh, and did from the get go and I knew back then that I had to be where the law and the people rub up against each other uh, in order to make justice happen because that's what the law is supposed to do is to serve justice uh, not, to, not to rule us but to serve justice make sure that we, we can produce a just result with the facts and the law put together. So the uh, I rushed on to law school, went to LSU Law School, worked my way through through LSU Law School. 
uh, graduated uh, with honors, cum laude, uh, was inducted into the Order of the Coif, which is a, a very uh, prestigious uh, scholastic and, uh, and professional uh, fraternity, I guess you would call it, but it's mostly a society because it's uh, men and women. It's not a fraternity. And uh, after, and tore into the practice of law, worked for a couple of years with a large firm, and uh, was handling cases at that time. I was among, you know, I was the what they called the cream. I had my pick of jobs. As a matter of fact, one of the jobs that I turned down was the FBI, uh, which, by the way, offered more money than any of the others did. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, that that career did not intrigue me, and if I'd taken it. I'd be going a whole different route, and I wouldn't be where I am today. I'd be retired. And uh, the uh, you know went on with the firm, and that that wasn't what I wanted because I wasn't dealing with people. I was dealing with big companies. I was handling cases that most lawyers would give their right arm to have, and I was only twenty four. I was the youngest attorney in the state of Louisiana, and I'm handling cases that that twenty, thirty, forty year men would have loved to have had. I handled a spinoff of Pennzoil from United Gas Pipeline. I, I handled uh, major litigation between big companies. Uh, you know, it, but it wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I wasn't dealing with people. I wasn't solving problems. An attorney's purpose in life is to solve his client's problems. And I wasn't solving problems. I was just moving money from one pocket to another. I bailed out and set up my practice and uh, starved, worked my way up. Uh, over the course of those years, I managed to have an opportunity on several occasions to go up and challenge what I thought was less than perfect law and uh, was able to successfully prosecute and advocate cases that made uh, new law in a number of occasions uh, and clarified or improved the law in a number of others. And after 14 years of practice, I was inducted into the LSU Law School Hall of Fame. I, I'm uh, informed that, you know, primarily because of my advocacy uh, track record. So, you know, at this point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I've got about 25 years under my belt, or, or 20 to 25 years under my belt. I'm really coming into my own. And I'm believing that uh, I've got a, I'm beginning to get a handle on this. I'm beginning to get the knack of it. Uh, whenever a former law partner of mine and I are having lunch and the subject of taxes comes up, and uh, he mentions, well, he doesn't have it, a problem because he doesn't file anymore. And I said, do what? And he says, no, he says, I don't file taxes anymore, not federal taxes, I don't file. And I said, <laughs> you got to be kidding. He said, no. He said, I'm not liable. There's no statute that makes me liable for the tax, and only liable people have to file a return. So I'm, I'm not required. The law doesn't require me to file a return. Well, I looked at him to see if his eyeballs were moving in, in the same direction, and they weren't rolling around. I, re I actually reached across the table. We were having lunch. I reached across the table and put my hand up against his forehead to see if he was running a high fever. And I told him, I said, George, you cannot have, you cannot have a tax without a law saying exactly who's liable. That's one of the three things you have to put into them. I've written tax laws before. My first position when I came out of law school was as a special advisor and draftsman for the Louisiana Constitutional Convention. I, and part of my responsibility, besides the uh, Declaration of Rights, uh, which was my primary responsibility, but part of that responsibility was taxation. And uh, I knew that you couldn't have a tax law without saying who had to write the check or you weren't going to get any checks. And I said, it's impossible, George. You know, that's not a loophole. That would be a whole wall of the city falling over. And I said, it's, it, it can't be. It's absolutely impossible. And he said, well, that's the way it is. And, I, and then I made a mistake, and I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll find uh, that statute that you can't find, and I'll show it to you, because I didn't want him getting in trouble. I knew that uh, you know, I already did know enough to know that the Internal Revenue Service was a rogue agency. I did know that they 
they did not operate under any limitations or any restraint. And I did know because of my involvement in politics, I was very heavily involved with one of the parties for about 25 years. Uh, and as a matter of fact, had managed uh, to uh, work my way up. I was a spin doctor. I was a strategist. Most of my time was spent in the smoke-filled back rooms. And I had gotten to the point where I was chairman of the party in my neck of the woods and was even getting calls from the White House two or three times a week asking for advice on how to spend this or that. I was hearing from people like Newt Gingrich and Phil Graham, Dick Army. And, uh, you know, I was I was moving along, and I moved up enough in the party to realize that the Republican Party had no more intention of throwing any freedom back over the walls for the peasants to reclaim than the Democrat Party did. They were both one and the same. It was just a left leg and the right leg of the same tyrant. So I already knew that our politics of our government had been corrupted, and I already knew that the Internal Revenue Service was a very dangerous organization, but it never occurred to me that they would actually violate the law. That was just beyond. That was way beyond the pale. So at this point, you had um, twenty to twenty-five years of, of legal experience working on extremely complex cases. You had the wherewithal to to dig in and find for George the statute, the the law that made him liable to pay the federal income tax and file federal tax returns. Yeah, and I and it, and it should be it should take but about five minutes. Because I knew exactly where it had to be. I mean, like I said, I've written these laws before. I've written tax bills for a state, for the city of Shreveport when I did some work. You know, I used to work for them. Uh, you know, when I was with the firm, I did an awful lot of work for the city. And uh, also, uh, I represented for a while a fire district, and I had to do a, a, a tax ordinance for them. So I knew it had to be there, and I knew where it'd be. So... Uh, I stopped off at the, at the library next chance I had because I don't have a federal library in my my, li- my law library wasn't equipped with federal codes and uh, I pulled out the uh, USCA the annotated uh, code and went to title 26 and uh, found right away the income tax it's the first subtitle subtitle A and uh, found the imposition section, section one, or you know, it'll be the next two or three sections. Always is. I flipped down, flipped down, flipped down. It wasn't there, wasn't there. Started went to the index. No, it's, I couldn't find liability under income tax. I looked under liability. I couldn't find income tax under liability. And I said, this is weird. So I started looking some more, but I ran out of time. Went back again, looked looked a little longer that time, and I started going through the whole title, and I couldn't find anything. So I went back to the office, and I ordered. Instead of, you know how the USCA is, it's got all these annotations. The code is about probably eight, nine volumes just for that title. So the, the sections are miles apart sometimes, separated by all of these case annotations. Maybe we should point out that USCA, US, United States Code Annotated, right. and Title 26, the, uh, the United States Code of Laws is broken down into a bunch of different titles, and Title 26 relates to income tax. Right, it's the Internal Revenue Code. And uh, so I ordered a, an Internal Revenue Code that wasn't, didn't have all of that annotation in it, just, just had the code sections and the uh, the history, legislative history on them. And I started going through that code, and I looked, and I found it, and I couldn't find it. And finally, because the only way I could be sure, I went through the entire code, uh, all the way from cover to cover, and I read every page, every paragraph, every section, every subsection, every phrase, of the Internal Revenue Code, because it's the only way that I could prove to myself that it was not there somewhere. And the the fact is that uh, it isn't. Now, you, if you look at Section 1, it says on the titles, Tax on Individuals, and that caught my eye because individuals is not a term that, that uh, legal wordsmiths use 
We well, use Tom, person. We, got, we use we any. Got a, we don't use individual. We got a break coming up. Our guest is attorney Tom Cryer, and he's just getting into the details of what he actually found when he opened the Internal Revenue Code, and who would have a better uh, ability to understand it than an attorney with 25 years' experience. We'll be right back. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. I am the agent for truth, Joe Bannister, and our guest is attorney Tom Cryer. Uh, we only have an hour with Tom, minus the break, so I'm just going to jump right back into it. Before the break, Tom was getting into uh, the nitty-gritty of some of, the, some of the things he learned in the Internal Revenue Code. And, and remember, this is an attorney who at the time had uh, over a quarter century of ex- legal experience, uh, training and education. Uh, so he knew exactly where to go. He even wrote, helped to write tax laws. So he knew... Who who could be a better investigator than Tom? And there are, as he said before, uh, there are interesting uh, connections between uh, Tom's story and mine. So, Tom, please uh, continue there with some of the details that you uncovered when you opened up uh, the Internal Revenue Code. Well, like you, I full well expected to to debunk uh, this friend's claims. And uh, after a thorough examination of the code, and and you got to remember that when you're reading tax laws, you've got to read them strictly. In other words, it's it's a letter of the law and only the letter of the law. In other statutes, we have a lot of slack. Uh, we can infer things of what the legislature meant for us to do. Or we could maybe it implies things, and we can we can use that implication and apply it, but not with a tax law and not with a criminal law. Those laws are strictly construed. It's by the letter and the letter alone. We can't even look, even if the legislature said we intend to do this, if the letter of law doesn't do it, it, it's not there. So Section 1, it appears to look like, it says it's imposing a tax on individuals, and then it goes on and says that uh, married individuals and uh, surviving spouses, you know, filing, uh, married individuals filing jointly and surviving spouses, and then it starts. All these are titles, headings. They don't say anything. And it says, there's hereby imposed on the taxable income of every married individual filing jointly, yada, yada. Well, most people think that means that there's a tax imposed on on uh, every married individual filing jointly, yada, yada. But that's not what it says. And so it's imposed on the taxable income. Uh, by By comparison, You've got Section 5001. It says there's hereby imposed on every gallon of distilled spirits a tax in the amount of so much per gallon by volume. Uh, well, you have distilled spirits. Why aren't you filing a, a distilled spirits tax return? Well, you may not have, Joe, but most people have some form of distilled spirits if it's only Dr. Tishner's in their household. Why aren't they paying the distilled spirits tax? Why aren't they filing the distilled spirits tax returns? Because it says it's imposed on every gallon, not just some of them, and they got some. So, you know, uh, the reason is, is that five sections later it says that the, the distiller or importer shall be liable for this tax imposed by 5001. All right, well, that's what I expected to find with the income tax. It wasn't there. And I saw, in the course of it, I found a bunch of weird things, too, like, you know, Section 33 that says that amounts withheld from non-resident aliens and foreign corporations shall result in a credit toward the tax owed. But there isn't any similar credit for monies withheld from American workers. Well, why is that? Well, come to find out, to make a long story short, there's no credit toward the tax because they don't owe a tax. It's not there. The only people who are liable for the income tax are people required to withhold taxes on non-resident agents and foreign corporations. And then I got to look at, it, at this, this term individual. I said, why are they doing that? This is weird. 
and I started looking for a definition for individual, and I finally found it buried in the regulations that an individual is defined as a non-resident alien. I looked at the other definitions, and I found that a person is defined as an individual. But there's another definition that you hardly ever see in the code, and that's the definition of a United States person, and that's a citizen or resident. But it doesn't say anything about citizen or resident tax returns. It's only individual tax returns, and that's somebody else, a non-resident alien. I know that sounds wacky, and I said it's wacky, and I just couldn't believe it. And I said, this cut, and I went back through it again. And again, it had to be there, and it wasn't. And I finally had to admit. And and I'll tell you what I you know I asked you earlier what it felt like, and and uh, I'll describe my feeling. I you know normally I guess you would think that people would start jumping up and down and celebrating. Hey, I don't I don't know the tax. I don't know the tax. George doesn't know the tax. He's he's not required to file. He's not going to get in trouble. But that wasn't the reaction I had. I felt like I was heartbroken. I, I, that's the only way I can describe it is that my heart was broken. I had devoted my life to, to service of the law and the Constitution, and I am sitting here telling a guy to file tax returns, you know, because it's got to be there. It has to be the law, and then I found out that it isn't. I, I'd always trusted my government to do what was legal. I didn't trust them to tell me the truth. I mean, I haven't taken anything the government has said at face value since the Warren report. But I, I never, it never occurred to me that they would just go out and violate the law, that they would lie about what the law was. And I, I felt like somebody who just put his last kid through college and found out that none of those kids were his. Right. That's, well, I, I, I can feel for you because I know that same kind of feeling. That I was, I was just, I was. I was angry, I was depressed, I was sad, I was uh, I was hurt, I, and, I, and I couldn't help but think back and look back at all of the people, all the generations, my father, all the things that he wanted to do for those seven kids, you know, for us, the trips that he wanted to take us on one of these days, it never happened. That would have happened if he had merely been allowed to keep what he was legally entitled to keep, and that was the fruits of his labor. So I spent the next two years not investigating whether, Joe, but why. I went back all the way through all of the tax cases in the Supreme Court. I went back through, and I came back and even looked at lower court cases and saw how they related. I wanted to know how they pulled this off and why. Why didn't they just make everybody liable? Why didn't they just pass a law saying everybody's liable and everything that comes in is income? And I found out. That the, the taxing authority of the federal government is very limited. The Constitution doesn't allow them in the first place to impose a mandatory tax on any citizen. That would be a direct tax if it was mandatory, if it wasn't avoidable, if it wasn't for an activity that they could choose to engage in or not to engage in. I also found out that, that the federal government is not allowed to tax rights, the exercise of a right. I found out, too, and this was a shocker, that the 16th Amendment did not authorize any new tax, that the only thing the 16th Amendment did was tell the Supreme Court that it couldn't do something. I know, uh, and that's not that's 180 degrees off of what I've always been told, but the 16th Amendment did not create any new taxing power. It did not authorize the income tax. They had the authority to do the income tax to begin with. They had had one already in 1862 during the Civil War. They had another one in 1894 that was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And uh, and that was why the 16th was was uh, amended, because the court came up with this new twist. The court came up with this new test, and they said, no, you can't use that test anymore. You've got to go back to the way it was before. And, you know, so... I, I had to go back all the way back to 13th century uh, Netherlands, you know, the Dutch, uh, with the uh, the origination of the excise tax, all the way back through Magna Carta, all the way back through and up through to today, all of the case law, all of the statutory law, all of the legislative history of the income tax, every single one of them, and all of the regulations that were promulgated. And back then... It was real clear 
that you should not include in gross income anything that isn't income within the meaning of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. And they would tell you very clearly, you're not required to put in anything here that's not taxable by the federal government under fundamental law or under the Constitution. They would tell people this in the regulations. But then those things started to go away. In 1954, in particular, they changed the subject of the tax to taxable income from net income. And so they decided, since we're telling you already that we're not taxing anything that isn't taxable, we don't have to tell you to take out anything that isn't. And since we're telling you we're only taxing income, we don't have to tell you not to include anything that isn't income. And then you find out that income means entirely different from what we thought it meant. We always thought it meant whatever came in, and it's only profit. It's only the profit. How much profit is in a paycheck? Zero. Well, the the government says that your your labor is worth zero, but labor isn't worth zero. It's it, the Supreme Court says it's your property. It's, if you if you sell property, you're entitled to have some kind of basis. But labor is the only one that the IRS contends is the basis is zero. It's worth worthless. You're not giving anything at all to your employer in exchange for your labor. It's a hundred percent profit. I don't believe that. Neither does the Supreme Court, and uh, which is why the Supreme Court has refused to hear any cases for the last forty years on that. You know, uh, they're not going to hear it because they would have to overturn sixty-eight Supreme Court cases to be able to put the income tax on a working American. So that's when I realized that they would have taxed us if they could have taxed us, but they couldn't, so they didn't. Instead, they use deceit and it's intimidation. Deceit, intimidation, extortion, and even if necessary, force. Including lethal force. I mean, look at what happened in Kerry. You've seen the videos from the Kerry case where they're crashing in through unlocked doors in the front of a business, crashing in with, with uh, you know, ramrods, or whatever you, you would call that, you know, where you... Battering ram. Battering, that's it. And the door's unlocked. All they had to do was open it and they crash through it. Dogs, machine guns, that's lethal force to me. Uh, so they're willing to do whatever it takes. And if you don't pay them, by the way, folks, uh, they will take it at off at the elbow. I don't advocate that anybody do what I did. But what I did was I, you know, because they're, now, we're, for one thing, you've got truth attack you can fight through. And we give you a lot of ways to get out and fight the lies and the myths. And that's the side where the IRS doesn't have teeth and talons. That's a site where they can't strike back. That's truthattack.org. Right, and in a truth in a truth fight, the Internal Revenue Service is empty-handed. So uh, I decided that I would uh, confront them. I had no choice. I had three times sworn to uphold the Constitution, first as a cadet, second as an officer in the United States Army, uh, and uh, finally in uh, Chief Justice Summers' chambers in 1973, 37 years ago, as an attorney. And uh, like you, I did not swear to my second cousin, or the, the guy two doors down. I, I swore my oath to God. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to violate that knowingly. And so I confronted them. And I, I, I started refusing to file taxes in 19, after 1993, that's I think my last return. I haven't filed since. And I won't file until they can show me that they have a lawful basis for their demand that I give them my financial information and turn over a part of my personal earnings to them. And they haven't been able to do so. Uh, the IRS couldn't do it. They brought in the CID. The CID couldn't do it. They tried to ramp it up, you know, scare me. Uh, tried to intimidate me. Uh, and uh, whenever George, who by this time I'm using him for my attorney, after all, he got me into this mess, <laughs> uh, George points out to this CID agent that, well, now Mr. Cryer has indicated repeatedly that if you can just show him that you have a right to any of this or that he has taxable income or a requirement to file, that he'll do so immediately. And, uh, you know, now, that's not an argument. That's a question. That's just saying, show me that you have a right to, to demand this. 
And the, the comeback was, that's a, that is a, tax pro, a frivolous tax protester argument. Wow. Well, after, we got a break coming up, one more segment, and Tom will describe uh, how they took him to court, uh, charged him with a bunch of crimes, and how he beat them, how he was acquitted, and of course, because he was doing the right thing and they were doing the wrong thing, they being the IRS and the, uh, IRS and the Department of Justice. We'll be right back. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, the Agent for Truth, agentfortruth.com, freedomabovefortune.com. Our guest is attorney Tom Cryer, and uh, we've got this one last segment of about uh, 12 or 13 minutes. So I'm going to shut up and just uh, let Tom talk about uh, what the government's reaction was to all of his fact-finding and truth-seeking. Tom? Well, there's no way to cover that in 10 minutes, but what basically they did was they reacted uh, violently. They, uh, you know, the, the agent who I first confronted... Uh, with the the law and uh, did it in a very general way because you don't want to tip your hand when you're dealing with the government silence is golden but I did tell her that if she knew of any taxable income I had or any requirement to file a return please point it out to me so that I can comply with it and that made her angry uh, what really ticked her off though was I suggested to her that the forms that she sent me that she wanted me to fill out didn't qualify as a uh, proper request for documentation or information because they had no OMB number showing that the Office of Management and Budget had approved those. And uh, that if she would make her request for information in a lawful manner, I would provide whatever information the law required me to provide. And uh, that made her angry because it suggested that she was not above the law. And so she reacted and did a lot of weird stuff, and I'll skip through that. We brought in, eventually ended up bringing in CID, who, like I said earlier, tried to intimidate and threaten. Well, that didn't work, and uh, I'm still waiting for an answer. And so they, they uh, confer grand jury, and there's discussion there, and I'm asked to come in and discuss possible amicable resolution with the assistant U.S. attorney. And uh, she wants me to plead guilty to a crime. And I said, look, I've never lied to a court in my entire life, and I'm not going to start now. Uh, but even then, uh, you know, in negotiations, if you want to try to enforce something, all you need to do is show me that you have a right to something, and I'll see to it that you get it. That's, what, that's called looking for a legitimate interest. And I said, the only thing I see that you would have any interest in, in uh, having me plead guilty to a crime I didn't commit is that you would put my head on a lance to frighten the peasants with. And she shrugged her shoulders and grinned and said, well, yeah, like, you know, is, there's nothing wrong with that. And I said, that's not a legitimate interest. So and it turned out, they turned around and they indicted me for two counts of evasion. They used a trust that I had created for my disabled wife at the time to try to build up something to insulate her if something should happen to me. And... Uh, you know what? You know it just uh, there was no income, by the way, in there. They said I hit income, but I showed through an emotion uh, certified by a CPA who had reviewed all the uh, documentation on those accounts that not only was there no income, but that the trust suffered losses both years, and uh, the trust wasn't made up for tax purposes. I made myself the trustee. My name was in five places on the. Uh, SS4, where the trust got a, an identification number. The trust was created before I ever knew there was a problem with the Internal Revenue Service or the Internal Revenue Code. But they indicted me nonetheless for that. Somebody had to lie under oath. And uh, they won't. They refused to tell me who it was, and they refused to prosecute whoever it was for perjury. And that tells me it was a government agent. Uh, there are lots of 
of neat stories about some of the things that uh, this agent pulled and how it proves that the Department of Justice is looking the other way intentionally, how they know the truth, how the court knows the truth, and will go out of its way to keep the truth from coming out. Uh, and to keep from have, holding uh, rogue agents like the one I had uh, accountable for violations of the law. They will do anything to cover it up. And that includes judges. So uh, we went to trial. We tried the case for two days. And at the end of the trial, the uh, jury came back after a very short deliberation period, which, by the way, Joe, uh, you probably are aware that when a jury on, only deliberates for a short period of time, it's not usually good news when they come back. So uh, I'm sitting there reminding myself, or standing there, watching the jury file in, and none of them were looking at me. That's another bad sign. And I'm reminding myself that you knew before you did this that there was going to be a price associated with doing the right thing. And you knew and you balanced that no matter what they did to you, it would not be as bad as living with having violated your oath. So, you know, whatever this is, it's still better than what, you know, the alternative was. And they came back with uh, two verdicts of not guilty across the board, and uh, which was like taking a ton off. The problem is, in the meantime, that they had gone out to all my clients and scared them off, told them that if you keep doing business with this guy, you're going to end up in a federal criminal investigation of your own, and uh, sent out form letters to them if it was too far for them to go out and, and visit with them, or they called them and told them these things. Uh, it destroyed my practice that I had spent 35 years building. Just absolutely destroyed it. And so, you know, and, and uh, so I ended up, I won, but I've lost everything. I lost my home. Uh, I lost my uh, all my clients from going off, running for the tall grass because they're afraid. Uh, I've, you know, had to sell everything in order to, you know, get by and to, to pay for my defense. And uh, even then, that wasn't enough. But the tax honesty community came to my rescue. Thanks, primarily, you were the first one to send the word out, by the way, Joe, that, that Tom Cryer has been charged and he needs help. His attorney in Shreveport needs help, help him out. And your people came running and, and started sending contributions in. If it hadn't been for that, uh, I might not have made it through because I can't defend myself in a cardboard box in an alley in downtown Shreveport. So, uh, you know, that's that's basically what what occurred. In the meantime, I saw, I found out there was a tax honesty movement. I didn't know about DV Kid. I didn't know about you know uh, Steve Hempling. I didn't know about Larry B. Kraft. I didn't know about all these people that were involved in this movement to get the truth out. I didn't know about you. And when I did find out, I, I was shocked because everybody's was out working separately. They weren't working together. So I formed Truth Attack as a form of co alliance to unify the tax honesty movement and ultimately the entire freedom movement. And uh, right now, Truth Attack is, is doing a lot of good things, but it, the main thing that it does is it gives people like you and me who have come to the light, who have realized that this is just a giant fraud, it's given them a way to fight different from the way you and I fought. It's given them a way to fight by exposing the lies and the myths instead of taking the beast on one-on-one. -on -one. You and I took them on heads up. But uh, but people don't have to do that. They can continue to, to pay tribute to the beast just simply because it's bigger than they are. And I tell them, consider that to be a remain free to fight another year tax. And then get your money's worth by fighting every single day, doing something to make someone aware of the truth. And we give them a whole lot of ways to do that. Uh, coming up April 15th, right now, if somebody wants to do something, they can go to, to truthattack.org and click on Operation Stop Thief up at the top. 
and and you know register their group of people. And the group of people could be one or two people for Operation Stop Thief. Where last year we put people in front of 1,200 post offices on April 15th, handing out flyers and holding up signs saying "What Income Tax Truth Attack dot org," and directing them to the truth. Yeah, and, so, I, and I've participated in those, and they're they're a blast. <laughs> they, they are. It's it, it, and, you know, and, and the post office people don't know what to do. They come out there, and now last year they had a, had a plan, and this year I think they'll have another plan, but. You know, they, they try to come up with these lame excuses why you can't do that. And we just stand our ground. But last two years now, this is our third Operation Stop Thief. Uh, last year it was up from 734 to 1,200 post offices. We handed out over 2 million flyers to freshly blooded people who had just had to write a check or they wouldn't be filing on the last day. And... Uh, you know, it's it's a very, very important project, and you can participate in this just by registering. We, you know, if uh, if we need to, we'll send you a couple of signs. But when you register, you get the whole package of tips and checklists and do's and don'ts, a press release so that you can get the press release out to the people in your area, uh, and how and how to make sure everybody's safe, that there's nobody gets hurt, nobody gets overtaxed. Uh, how to deal with the police, how to deal with the, the media, how to deal with the public, how to deal with the post office employees. Everything that you need. And uh, it, it's right there. The minute you register, it'll say, click here for your materials. And uh, you can get right to work on it. And it's just uh, it's a fantastic project. We almost didn't have it this year. Uh, a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago in Ontario, I mentioned to the group of people there, that uh, we weren't going to be able to have Operation Stop Thief because of financial limitations this year. And afterwards, a guy walked up and said, hey, if it would this amount make a difference and allow you to have it? And I said, yes, it would. And he said, well, I'm sending that to you. So we're back on for That's Operation fantastic. Stop Thief. That's fantastic. And this is a way that people can look forward to April 15th. I mean, I, as I say, I, I have a blast when I go out there. Uh, I usually go to uh, the Reno Post Office, Reno, Nevada, uh, Tom goes out to the post office near him, probably Shreveport, and, uh, you know, 1,200 post offices, and hopefully we can do that much or more this year. And it's really a, a, a great opportunity to uh, do something good on April 15th. But, you know, I, I think that the main thing is, is that on, on your story and on my story, uh, Joe, is that when we learned the truth, we acted on it. And uh, people don't have to act like you and I did because you and I had a special commitment. You know, uh, not everybody is is bound to do that. But even then, even if they were bound, there are different ways to fight. And when something you're fighting with something is so much stronger than you are, you can't allow strength to determine the outcome. We have to fight smart. And uh, those that that smart fighting is listed there at truthattack.org on how we can what you can do a lot of things you can do without getting having to take any risks without having to, to put yourself in harm's way and uh, that's the way we have to fight you always if you can fight with the enemy where you can hurt him but he can't hurt you back that's the best kind of battle but it's we got 300 million people that we need to wake up and tell the truth to. And I'd say the word is uh, spreading rather rapidly. Um, now, Tom, tell the listeners uh, that you're you know, you are also a host on Liberty Works Radio Network, and uh, you have a show during the week, correct? Yes, and we cover a lot besides taxes. We cover whatever's current mostly, and once in a while we'll talk about taxes because that's, of course, our first tentacle. Truth Attack is out to... Uh, uh, to put the government back in its box one tentacle at a time. We want to be free again, and that won't happen until they get back inside the Constitution and leave us alone. And uh, the first tentacle is the Internal Revenue Services raping of the American people. And when you learn about the money system and you learn about the Fed and how it all works together, you realize that this is a gigantic theft. And uh, what... Uh, we do, we also have a program, Truth Attack has a program, 5 to 6 Eastern, right here on the Liberty Works Radio Network, 
uh, and weekdays, Monday through Friday. And sometimes it's me, sometimes it's somebody else. But it's always somebody talking about the truth and talking about freedom. And you're not going to hear about either of those anywhere but right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Well, Tom, thank you so much for uh, taking a whole two hours, uh, in addition to all your other stuff, to be on the show. Um, Tom Cryer, truthattack.org. I'm Joe Bannister, the Agent for Truth, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Joe.